speak to us tonight and that the Word of God would have free course, that many people would uh, hear the truth tonight and, and be uh, solidified on what they believe, stirred up about what they believe, and also equipped to preach the truth to others. And I pray that uh, this service would change someone's life in a positive way and help them to appreciate uh, some of the greatness of your creation and of, and of your works, your God, and of your Bible. And in Jesus' name I pray, Amen. Now, this chapter, the, the part that I want to focus on of this chapter, and the, this whole chapter talks a lot about this, but the main part that I want to look at right now is in verse number 3, where the Bible reads, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. That's someone who mocks, who makes fun. Scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, or by the world that then was being overflowed with water, perished. Now what the Bible is talking about here is those who do not believe in God. Those who do not believe the Bible. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that they are willingly ignorant of the fact that God created this world, and they're willingly ignorant of the fact that there was a flood, the Bible reads there, in verse number 6, where the Bible says that the earth being overflowed with water perished. He says these are two things that they are willingly ignorant of. That means that they choose to be ignorant. Why would anyone choose to be ignorant that God created this world? Well, the answer is clear in verse number 3. The Bible says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. That's the problem right there. Turn back to a famous passage in Psalms. Turn to Psalm 14, and we'll get into the message, but look at Psalm 14. This is a famous passage in the Bible. Psalm 14, and verse number 1, the Bible reads, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now, why did the fool say in his heart that there is no God? Finish the verse. That's not where the verse ends. The Bible reads, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and see God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Where does the godless mentality of our society come from? Where does the godless idea that the world came into existence from nothing where does the godless idea of evolution come from? The godless doctrine, and get, get back to 2 Peter chapter 3, that's where we're going to be for a while. Where does this godless philosophy come from? Hey, it comes from people who live a life of ungodliness and wickedness that's dominated by their own sinful lusts. See, you have to start reading in verse number 3, when you read about somebody who's ignorant of God's creation, they're ignorant of the fact that God created the world. It all goes back to their lustful, sinful nature that we read about in chapter 14 of Psalms, where God said they're abominable, they're altogether become filthy, there's none that do with good, no, not one, and that's why they become foolish in their own imaginations. That's why they become, I'm sorry, vain in their own imagination, that their foolish heart is darkened, it says in Romans 1. And that's why they become a fool and say, there is no God. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now here's the principal problem with evolution is found in verse number 3. I'm sorry, verse number 4 of chapter 3. It says, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's the theory of evolution. The ungodly man says in 2 Peter 3, 4, that all things just continue the way that they've always been. Billions and billions of years have gone. And things just keep going and going and going and going. Well, that's just not true. Let me, let me read this for you. Well, actually, I found two pieces of news. Uh, one of them was just came up today in the news. Well, this is what it is. This is groundbreaking stuff. I mean, this is science. This is real science. Okay. Uh, they discovered the bone and the leg of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. This is up in, it was like Hell Creek, Montana. Nice name for a town, huh? They have a church there, it's called Hell Baptist Church. <laughs> Hell Creek Baptist Church. But anyway, Hell Creek, Montana. They found this bone. And you would not believe this, but 68 million years later, there's still a little bit of the tissue. You know? 
I mean, think about it. I mean, if you if you t- if you took a chicken bone and you eat all the chicken and throw that bone outside, how long do you think it's going to take that thing to dry out completely? But you got to understand, it's a pretty big bone, okay? And so, but it still has a little bit of the meat left on the bone, literally. It's what was in the news today. And so they, it's in the limestone. It's been preserved and sixty-eight million years. Still got a little bit of the, the meat on it, okay? And so they stuck a, a needle in there, some kind of a needle, way into this thing, and they pulled out some proteins, is what it was, is what they're calling it. You know, just a little bit of protein. And they got out these proteins, and boy, these guys, I mean, these guys are smarter than anybody in this room. I'll tell you that right now. I mean, there's nobody in this room that can match. I mean, I feel embarrassed even talking about this, this kind of science, because I'm such a layman. You know, when it comes to these things. But they went into their rooms and, and they got out all their uh, equipment and they discovered, and I'm not kidding about this, Pick up, go check the news, I'm not making this up. They found out that the closest, and you're going to think I'm telling a joke, but I'm not, the closest living relative of the Tyrannosaurus Rex is a chicken. I'm not making that up. I promise you. I'll show it to you. Come to me after the service and I will show you the news article. They said, first a chicken and next was a frog or a newt. When they compared these proteins and these amino acids, and I'm not, I promise you that that's the truth. I would not get up here and lie to you, okay? Now, I've always mocked them. Well, we'll get that later. But let me, here's, something, here's an older story, okay? That was today. That was April 15th, 2007. It sounds like a joke, but it's not a joke. Remember, the fool is the one who came up with this. The lust-filled, ungodly fool. Uh, came up with it. But let me read this for you. Evidence for the universe expansion found. Evidence. Now, first of all, when I look at the word evidence, I'm an etymologist by nature. I used to study a lot of foreign languages. I home in right away on those four letters, V-I-D-E, like video, because that means that you saw something, like visual. That's what evidence means. We have evidence. I mean, you can lay eyes on it. Okay. Evidence for universe expansion found. Listen to this. Physicists announced Thursday, and this is an older news story, that they now have the smoking gun that shows the universe went through extremely rapid expansion in the moments after the Big Bang. This is Associated Press. This isn't some dumb little, you know, this is a major news organization. In the moments after the Big Bang, growing from the size of a marble, okay, this is the Big Bang, started out the size of a marble to a volume larger than all of observable space, okay, Listen to this. In less than a trillion trillionth of a second. I, you know, I'm at a loss. I don't even know what to say to that. I don't know what to say to somebody that's that foolish. That's that dumb. I mean, how can anyone believe in that? Oh, you believe in the Bible? Are you nuts? No, you're nuts, okay? How can something grow from the size of a marble... To the size of the observable space in less than a trillion trillion. I mean, these people, they must be laughing when they're writing this. Thinking, people are so stupid, they're actually going to believe us. I mean, this is the way I picture it. I picture them all sitting around a big table with some boxes of pizza, a couple of cases of beer, okay? And they're just like, why make it three seconds? You know, why would we say that it went from a basketball to a, you know, the whole universe in three seconds? Let's just make it a trillion trillionth of a second. Nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to believe. Nobody's going to check it out. How in the world do they think they know what happened 13 and a half billion years ago that the earth went from the size of, not the earth, the whole universe went from the size of a marble? Everything jammed into a marble. See, you have to be a fool to believe that there's no God and to believe in this garbage. That's the truth. Let me continue reading. And these guys are not kidding. I mean, you, you think this is comedy hour tonight? No, it's not. It's, this is Sunday night preaching service. You didn't stumble into some comedy club instead of uh, church tonight. All right, let me read this for you. The discovery, which involves an analysis of variations in the brightness of microwave radiation. So there's a couple of guys looking up at the sky... Oh man, it's a little brighter over here than it is over here. And that's where they get this. Now, isn't that amazing? That's their evidence. Brightness of microwave radiation. I'm reading every word of this. I'm not editing it or anything to make it sound dumb. I'm reading every word. Uh, variations in the brightness of microwave radiation is the first direct evidence. 
to support the two-decade-old theory that the universe went through what is called inflation. So it started out 20 years ago as a theory. Now we've got evidence. I mean, now we know this is true. Now that we see these variations in brightness. It also helps explain how matter eventually clumped together into planets, stars, and galaxies in a universe that began as a remarkably smooth, super hot soup. Okay, that's how it started. But then it started to clump together into planets, stars, and galaxies. It's giving us our first clues about how inflation took place. You know, this guy's got his glass like taped in the middle. Said, Mike, said Michael Turner, Assistant Director for Mathematics and Physical Sciences at the National Science Foundation. This is absolutely amazing. Uh, Brian Green. Okay, Brian Green. Let's hear what Brian Green, a Columbia University physicist, said. The observations are spectacular. And the conclusions are stunning. Okay, listen to this. Okay, too much humor. All right. Researchers found the evidence for inflation by looking at a faint glow that permeates the universe. That glow, known as the cosmic microwave background, we can't have a microwave for soup, right? Okay, a cosmic microwave background was produced when the universe was about 300,000 years old. That's long after inflation had done its work. But just as a fossil tells a paleontologist about long extinct life, the pattern of light in the cosmic microwave background <laughs> offers clues about what came before it. Of specific interest to physicists, are subtle brightness variations that give images of the microwave background a lumpy appearance. Isn't that amazing? I love their terminology. Isn't this really like scientific terminology? Smooth, lumpy, chunks, you know. Okay, uh, physicists presented new measurements of these variations during a news conference at Princeton University. But wouldn't you love for your kids to go up and graduate and go to one of these Ivy League schools? That's my dream. I'm saving up right now in the college fund. I want my kids to go to one of these schools like, like Princeton or Stanford or Harvard. That's my dream. Yeah, right. So they can learn about soup all day. I might as well, I might as well send them to go work at the, at the Campbell's factory or something. They probably learn something more. Oh, hold on a second. Let me, let me get to where I was at in this. Earlier studies of WMAP data have determined that the universe is 13.7 billion years old. Give or take a few hundred thousand years. What's that mean? You know, I mean, come on, hey, a couple hundred thousand years. How, how specific do you want us to get? Okay, uh, WMAP also measured variations in the cosmic microwave background, so huge that they stretch across the entire sky. Uh, those earlier observations are strong indicators of inflation, but no smoking gun, said Turner, who was not involved in the research. <laughs> this guy wasn't even part of it. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. Uh, the new analysis looked at variations in the microwave background over smaller patches of sky. It's a little bit smaller area they're looking at. Only billions of light years across, instead of hundreds of billions. You, do, does anybody know how big a light year is? It's the speed that light travels in a year. Okay, the distance, I'm sorry, that a light travels in a year. So light travels at 186, or 187,000 miles a second. That's how fast light goes. So you're traveling 187,000 miles per second. Okay. For a year. That's one light year. They're talking about billions of light years. And that's a small, just a small cross section. You know, we're not doing big, like hundreds of billions of light years. And then remember it was evidence before. Now they're saying the data, fla the data favors inflation. Yeah, we're leaning toward inflation. Said Charles Bennett. A John Hopkins University, wouldn't you love your children to go there and, and, and be under this guy's uh, tutelage, who announced the discovery? He was joined by two Princeton colleagues, Lyman Page and David Spurgle, who also <laughs> contributed to the research. Bennett added, it amazes me, I love what Charles Bennett said, it amazes me that we can say anything at all about what transpired in the first trillionth of a second of the universe. Yeah, it amazes me too. I'm a little bit surprised myself. Okay, now, you... Uh, don't come up to me after the service and tell me that, that somebody stumped you about this thing of evolution and that, and that uh, you're some kind of an underdog or, oh, we, we can't seem to make science and the Bible jive. If that's science, then no, we can't. But I, that's called science falsely so-called, is what the Bible calls that. At the end of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says, oppositions of science falsely so-called. Now, let me go through this uh, scripturally for you. Look at Genesis chapter 1. 
Genesis chapter number 1, and look at verse number 1. I love how the Bible begins. I love everything about the Bible. The Bible is such a phenomenal book. It's the book of all books. I just love the beginning. Because I, I love how God doesn't just sit us down at the beginning and say, let me explain to you all the reasons why you should believe in me. Let me explain, let me prove to you that I really exist. He just says, no. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. Now, you can believe that or you cannot believe that. You cannot believe that and go to hell, is what God's saying. He's just saying, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day. Isn't the King James Bible so hard to understand? And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, here we see the creation story in chapter 1 of Genesis. Now, there are so many false doctrines out there. One of them is called theistic evolution. It's a doctrine that says, well, we believe in God, we believe in the Creator, but good night. You heard what Charles Bennett said. I mean, you heard what Tom Spurgle said. I mean, we have the smoking gun. We know evolution's real. So maybe there's a way that we can put the Bible and evolution together. And so there are several different theories. Number one is called the gap theory. People say there's a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. In Genesis 1-1 it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And then they say, uh, verse 2 starts out billions of years later. When the earth was without form and void. Because God destroyed it for whatever reason. And there used to be other people living on it. And there were other animals. And, uh, and the people that were on it were like Neanderthal man. I mean, I've heard this in churches. They were like Neanderthal man. They, did, they were made in God's image. But then, like billions of years later, he destroyed all them and said, okay, let's make man in our image. Okay, let's start over with Adam and Eve. Now, conclusive proof that the gap theory is wrong is found in Exodus 20, verse number 7, if you take notes, but you don't have to turn there. I'm sorry, Exodus 20, 11. I'm sorry, I told you the wrong thing. Exodus 20, 11. The Bible reads, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. That's verse 1. That's Genesis 1, 1. He made God created the heaven and the earth. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea... See, that's all the way on, uh, you know, day number 2 now we're getting into. The sea and all that in them is. You know, that's days 5 and 6. So we see that there is no gap. In Exodus 20.11, because we have God creating the heaven and the earth, and all that in them is, in six days, and he rested on the seventh day, and, and hallowed it, and so forth. Now, another thing that's, that's taught is what's called the day-age theory. Okay? Number one was the gap theory. Anybody still believe in the gap theory? No. Because if you read Exodus 20.11, the gap theory is gone. Okay? Uh, number two is called the day-age theory. Well... A day with the Lord is like a thousand years. And so maybe when God says on the first day he did this, on the second day, maybe he's just talking about an indefinite period of time. And if, hey, if a day is like a thousand years, maybe a day is like a million years, right? And so maybe these days are actually millions of years long periods describing God creating through evolution. Now let me explain to you what's so silly about that. On the first day, we'll run through this quickly. On the first day, what did God create? Light and darkness. On the second day, what did God create? The firmament. Dividing the waters which are under the firmament, which would be the, the seas, the water, like the ocean, the lakes, and rivers, all it was was just one great sea at that point, and the waters above the firmament, which is known as our atmosphere, which contains moisture. Okay? Then on the third day, what did he do? He created the dry land. Then on the fourth day, he created the sun, moon, and stars. And, the, you know, the heavenly bodies. Then on the fifth day, God created the uh, animals that live in the air and the animals that live in the sea. Then on the sixth day, God created all the land animals. And then he created man. And that's all on the sixth day. Now, here's the problem with that. How are these... Now, the plants... Keep in mind... I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, I missed something. When I said that God created the dry land on day three, he also created plants. Okay, so how did the plants live for millions of years with no sun? Because the sun wasn't created until day four. How were, the, how were the flowers pollinated with no bees that were created on day number six? 
Okay? You see, this whole uh, world that we live in, our ecosystem, our environment, is such a balance of animals and plants working together that plants rely on animals and animals rely on plants. And so, and as you know, the plants rely on the sun. Every single plant relies upon the sun. Now, how could these, uh, how could these systems function independently? How could all the whole plant world be functioning with no animals? How could the uh, animal kingdom and the, and the fish and the fowl, what's the bird going to eat? There's no bugs. The bugs are going to be created a couple million years later. Okay, that makes no sense. And just in case some uh, warped theologian came along and tried to teach this day-age theory, God was very clear when he said this. He says it over and over. And sometimes I remember as a child reading Genesis chapter 1 saying, Why is God so repetitive? The evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. The evening and the morning were the third day. God's saying, I have to tell it to you six times for you to understand that I'm talking about a literal day and a literal night with the sun rising in the morning and the sun setting at the evening. That's what evening and morning mean. And so God says, no, these are literal days of creation. Six literal days of creation and one literal day where God rested from all his work that he'd made. Now, also in Genesis chapter 1, we see evolution defied when God begins to talk about creating the plants. Look at verse number 12. Well, verse number 11, it even starts. It says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit, after his kind. See those three words? After his kind, no evolution, no change of a different kind, whose seed was in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And and here's more repetition from God. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. And then skip forward to when God gets into creating the animals on day number five. The Bible reads, and God said, well, let's look at verse number... 20. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth and in the open firmament of heaven. Now you say, what's the firmament? The firmament's confusing me. Well, look, where are birds fly? They're flying in the firmament. Okay, do you see that? And so the firmament is the atmosphere. The firmament is the sky, is what we would refer to it as. There's a canopy of air around the earth. And it contains water in that air, and that's what the firmament is. And so, that's why the Bible... The Bible defines itself for you. If, you. if you read it, it talks about birds flying in the firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth. Now look, God created every living creature. Well, he created some creatures, and then they became other creatures. No, he, every living creature that we know today was created right here, according to the Bible. He created every living creature on day five. It's in the, it's in the air and in the water that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. Why does God say this over and over? He knew what people would come up with. He knew the theory of evolution that would come up with. He knew Charles Darwin would come along and teach this stuff. And I'll venture to guess that people probably taught this long before Charles Darwin. There's something new under the sun. Who knows? I, I'd be willing to bet thousands of years ago people were probably coming up with theories like this. That that animals became humans and plants became animals and and strange things of that nature. They probably got it from Satan himself. And the Bible says, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind. I mean, how many times are you going to say it? And cattle after their kind. And everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Now, the Bible's very repetitive here. God's trying to make a point. He's trying to make a point. It's a little old day. He's trying to make a point. Things reproduce after their own kind. Now, you take a dog and a cat, they can't reproduce. Two different kinds. Now, did God say everything would bring forth after its species? No. This is after its kind. See, uh, modern day science has broken things down into kingdom, order, genus, phylum, uh, kind, species. You know, that's the different kingdoms. Well, our dogs, dogs are one kind. Okay? Whether you have a, a poodle, 
or a Boston Terrier or a Doberman or whatever, a Labrador, okay? Uh, they're all the same kind. They're all a dog. They all have four legs. They all have a tail. They all have a tongue and teeth and two eyes and nose. They all have hair of some kind. They're dogs. Can you breed a Boston Terrier with a poodle? Yes, you can. You know, I, well, I don't know how that would work, but you can breed. You know, poodles are great. Maybe a small poodle. But, you know, you can breed animals together. Why? Because they're the same kind. You say, well, you know, evolution... You take a poodle, because think about this, a poodle, and this is good science, uh, poodles are very big dogs. They're considered large dogs. And yet there are poodles that you can fit in the palm of your hand called a teacup poodle. And then there's a little bit bigger than that called a toy poodle. And then the bigger than that is called a miniature poodle. And then you have a standard poodle. Okay? Now, see, it's evolving. It evolved into a very small poodle. There's something called cultivation of crops. You can take the strongest, biggest crops... And you take the seeds from the really strong big crops, and that's what you plant next year. Then you take the strongest from those, and that's what you plant next year. Then you take the strongest and best and healthiest from those, that's what you plant next year. Pretty soon you have some very healthy crops. It's called cultivating crops. It's supposed to wild. You know, they're wild plants, and they're cultivated plants, where someone kept taking the best seeds and the best seeds and the best seeds and the best seeds, and they produce a better crop. People try to do that with human beings. They're wicked as hell. It's called Adolf Hitler and, and eugenics and all that kind of garbage. IVF, yes, that's part of it. So anyway, uh, these dogs and variations between dogs, you know, dogs of all different colors, dogs of all different shapes and sizes, they're still the same kind of animal. They will never cross that line of becoming another kind of animal. You know, when Charles Darwin... Uh, produced his theory, he was watching birds, and he was noticing birds that a whole bunch were this color, and a whole bunch were this color, and he was, he was on, a, he's on a slave ship, you know, transporting a bunch of slaves, okay? And he's, he's, uh, he's writing this down, he's taking notes, and that's where he came up with this theory of evolution, was from looking at the variations in birds. Hey, Charles Darwin, they're all birds. I know you think a chicken and a Tyrannosaurus Rex are practically the same thing, but they're not. Uh, they're very different kinds of animals. Now, when Noah got on the ark, he had two of every kind. Now, did he have every dog breed, every breed of horse? No. He probably just had two dogs. And from those two dogs, and you know, people have studied, and, and I don't take much stock in what scientists say these days because it's based on lies, but they've studied and said that all dogs come to a common ancestor. Well, that's probably true. It probably came from two dogs, a male and a female, that were on the ark. And those two dogs produced every kind of dog. But dogs and chickens did not come from a common ancestor at all. And that's where you have to draw the line at the kind. Now also notice another repetition. So you can learn so much from the repetition in Genesis chapter 1. Is that God saw that it was good. See, it's a finished product that he created. It's not something that he's still working on. He said, look, he created it and he saw it and it was good. It's done. It's finished. He finished all his work on the sixth day. Seventh day he rested it because it's done. It's very good, he said. Now, let me give you some other holes in evolution and I'm going to get more into the Bible. Here's some more holes that are found in evolution. Number one, evolution does not answer the question of where life came from. It has no answer at all. Where did life come from? I mean, they can talk about soup and bubbles and, and balls the size of a marble exploding and spinning everything into place. It still doesn't explain where the matter came from. It really explains nothing. It does not tell you. You say, where did all this come from? Evolution. That explains nothing. Because where did the building materials come from that this supposedly evolved from? Where did we come from? It does not answer the principal question. Number two, it does not answer the question of what is life. Can you tell me what life is? Can you tell me the difference between something that's living and something that's dead? You can take a human being who has died. You can hook them up to a machine. You can pump their blood. You can make their heart beat. You can make their organs function on a machine. I heard a story about a woman who was pregnant and died. They kept her body running on a machine and the baby was living in the womb of its mother, like a human incubator. Okay, that what, what is making her not be alive? I don't know. 
I think it's I think it's the Spirit of God. I think it's Jesus Christ that is the one who gives all life. By Him all things consist, the Bible says. Hey, I think it's the, the one who created life, the author of life. I think it's God who holds our breath in His hand. And He breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. That's where life came from. Where do the evolutionists say that life came from? Spontaneous generation is what it's called. Just out of nowhere, life. They've never been able to simulate it. They've never been able to reproduce it. They cannot bring anything to life. They'll, they'll make you think, with all these movies and lies out of Hollywood, that they can clone things. You know, when they clone something, all they really do is they take something that's already alive and replace the DNA. They didn't bring something to life. They can't bring anything to life. Remember when uh, Moses was uh, faced off with Janus and Jambres, the evil sorcerers, with uh, Pharaoh's court there? And he threw down his stake and it turned into a snake. They threw down their stake and it turned into a snake. Uh, they he made water into blood. They made water into blood. He made frogs come. They made frogs come. But you know what? There came a time when he took dirt from the ground, just like God did when he created man from the dust of the earth. When Moses took dirt from the ground and created lice. From the dust of the earth. And they said, we can't do it. This is the finger of God. We can't create life. And so that's where they had to draw the line. Because only God can create life. I could not explain to you right now what life is. I can't tell you the difference between something that's alive. Look in the dictionary what life is. I looked it up in the dictionary. And the dictionary is such a foolish book. I looked up the dictionary this is what it said. Something that moves and reproduces. You know, this was one of the things that it, that it listed. Okay, well, I guess a single person who never reproduced, I guess somebody who's a eunuch, I guess they uh, are not alive. <laughs> You're not alive, buddy. <laughs> you, you never reproduced? Not alive. We'll pronounce you living when you reproduce, sir. Oh, well, they have the capability to reproduce. Well, I guess a mule is not alive, because a mule can't reproduce. Cross between a, a donkey and a horse, it's called a mule, cannot reproduce. It's not alive, okay? I don't care if it's walking around, eating. It looks like it's alive. It's not alive because it doesn't have the ability to reproduce. See, there's no definite. Man tries to put a definite. Oh, it moves around. Hey, there are things that don't move that are alive. You see, man's definition is just that. It's man's definition. They don't know what life is. You know, they, when, when, when you look up life in the dictionary, you know what it should say? Just, it should just have a note that just says, see Holy Bible. That's all it should say, literally. What right do they even have to put any definition on the word life? They should say, read the Bible, and you decide what life is. Okay? Because God will tell you, he kills and he makes alive. The Lord is his name. So it doesn't really answer any questions that, that man really wants to know. Where did everything come from? What is life? Where, did, where are we going? It doesn't answer any of that. But number two... Here's another major hole in evolution. The fact that when I was in college, I was taught this, that uh, there is no, and this is a fact anyway, there's no writing, reading and writing, no cities, no intelligent civilizations older than 6,000 years old. Far less than 6,000 years old, in fact. But even if you wanted to stretch it as far as you can, they try to stretch it back as far as they can, they will not tell you that there's anything beyond 6,000 years back. They'll find, like, look, we found evidence of civilization 8,000 years ago. It's this arrowhead. This is 8,000 years old. Okay. We saw this picture in a cave of a, of a guy holding a spear like this. This is 7,900 years old. Okay. They have, no, they have no record of any civilizations, any kings, any buildings, any cities, any uh, reading and writing. But, alas, and this is what we were taught, 6,000 years ago, you wouldn't believe what they came across. They invented the wheel. Okay? Revolutionized everything. Okay? They went, and, and see, they, they believe that man, human being, in the first form being, what's the first form? There's, there's Homo sapiens is what we are, and then there's Homo erectus, and then before that was something else, and there, there's the three stages. They, they say man has been around for 100 million years. They say Earth has existed for 4 billion and the man has been around for 100 million years. So 100 million years of, ooh, 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 ah! Ooh, ooga booga! You know? Oh, ah. You know, caveman. Right? A million years, or I'm sorry, a hundred million years, I give or take a couple hundred million, whatever. But a hundred million years of, 
uh, the Flintstones, okay, to all of a sudden building buildings that mankind cannot even build today, like the pyramids. Like Stonehenge cannot be built today in 2007. No clue how they did it. Could not build Stonehenge. They could not build the pyramids. Uh, mega cities. I mean, we're not talking about little towns and villages. We're talking about mega cities. That, I mean, you, you study the Bible, and, study, and I used to study ancient history heavily. I studied the ancient Hittites in Asia Minor. I studied the Sumerians uh, with their cuneiform writing. These cities were giant mega cities with walls that were 60 feet thick, with rivers running through the city, irrigating the city, with people had indoor plumbing in these cities, literally. People had air conditioning in these cities. Now, it wasn't electricity, mind you, but they had ventilation shafts that went under their house that would force air and bring air through their house and cool down their house. They had underground uh, places to put things to keep them cold. These people were very intelligent. They had metallurgy. They had chariots. They had advanced weapons. They had weapon machinery. Now, it wasn't using electricity, but it was using sometimes even more intricate technology than even uh, electricity would provide. Unbelievable cultures. Uh, reading and writing uh, like you wouldn't believe. Our number system. You ever wonder... You ever wonder why different things in our, in our society are based on different numbers? Like, for example, what's our biggest number in, a, you know, in, in a modern day in the English and American system? It's number 10. Right? Everything's based on tens. You know, when we write numbers, we go from the ones to the tens to the hundreds. To that. It's all based on the number 10. But look, but the clock is not based on the number 10, is it? What's the clock based on the number 60? 60 minutes, 60 seconds, okay? Uh, when you study... Uh, degrees, and then you have, you have 24 hours, okay? You study the degrees on a, on a globe, you have 360 degrees, but then when you divide a degree, you divide it into minutes, and there's 60 minutes in a degree, and there's 60 seconds in a minute, okay? Now, why is that? Well, it all goes back to the ancient Sumerians. The ancient Sumerians had a number system based on 60, okay? And then there are other number systems in our culture that are based on the number uh, 16, I, I work in electronics. We have what's called, and if you're if you computer programmer, hexadecimal. You know what I'm talking about? Hexadecimal. It's number systems based on the number 16. I just programmed an alarm panel yesterday. It was hexadecimal. I programmed the account number. It was uh, each digit was one through 16. Not, and then there's you know there's binary, hexadecimal, and then there's tens, 60s. Hey, we're borrowing from intelligence and technology that goes back 6,000 years when we're using these uh, numbers revolving around the number 60. So we went from caveman to super advanced civilization. H how about this book that I'm holding in my hand? This book that I'm holding in my hand began to be written about 35, 3,700 years ago. Would you say it's a pretty advanced book? Oh, yeah. No one can write anything like this. No one has ever written anything. It was written by God. We know that this book does not really date back 3,500 years. We know that it dates back eternity past. But in their mind, in the ungodly, lustful, abominable fool's mind who denies that there's a God, hey, uh, this book, pretty amazing, huh? Can you write anything like this today, sir? You think we're going to be reading your article 3,500 years from now? Bowing down and worshiping it? Like we worship the Holy Bible? Huh? Like we say the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice? Like the Bible is God's Word? Like the words that Jesus Christ said in us, we believe that they are spirit and they are life, as John sa Jesus said in John chapter 6? No. So that's so ridiculous to say that they went from uh, Ooga Booga for 100 million years to just, they invented the wheel... And then they invented reading and writing. Now, do you think reading and writing and the wheel are even close to the same level of intelligence? How hard is it to invent a wheel? And let me just clear something up for you. The wheel was never invented. It's just always been around. Okay? Anyone, my kids would think of it. If we didn't tell them about it, they'd come tell me about it. Okay? Because it's not, it's not that complicated. Um, they went from the wheel and cultivating crops. Those are pretty simple things. Cultivating crops is a lot more complicated than, than the wheel. 
But then reading and writing at the same time? That's unbelievable. Reading and writing is very complicated. Reading and writing when nobody's ever re- read or written. And you just come up with it. That's pretty unbelievable. That's pretty amazing. There are cultures that have existed for a long time of homo sapiens sapiens that don't know how to read or write. Literally, these natives and these backward tribes and places. But I'll tell you what, they know what a wheel is. And they cultivate crops. Unless they're smoking too much peyote like some of these are. Oh, does that offend you? I'm sorry. Sorry to tell you the truth about about these backward native cultures. You don't like that? All right, that's fine. Get out of here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, how about this? How about the size of the sun? And I've talked about this before, but the size of the sun is going, the sun's going through a lifespan as a star. It's burning fuel. You think it just burns forever? You think it just burns the exact same brightness and the same heat all the time? No, it gets smaller every year, five meters per day. Now, you can't just add five meters a day. So think about this. If it's losing five meters a day, how about to go backwards? It's going to get bigger and bigger. Go backwards 100 million years. Just the time that they say man's been on the earth, let alone how long the earth's been around. Now, you can't just add five meters a day. Because as something gets bigger, that number gets smaller. And you use uh, calculus. You use calculus to determine how much. But if you use calculus and go back and determine that, the earth would be so hot 100 million years ago that no life could exist. It would be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of degrees. And if you go back the four billion years that they say that the earth has existed, the earth and the sun would be overlapping one another. The sun would be so big. It makes no sense. But see, remember their foolish thought in Second Peter 3 that all things continue as they've always been since the creation, which is in their mind the Big Bang. When it all started, it just all goes the same. I mean, for the last four billion years, this earth has been able to sustain life of some kind. It's just been the right oxygen, nitrogen uh, in the atmosphere. It's been just the right temperature just the right seasons, so you could go through this process of seed time and harvest. The earth has been tilted just that right axis for the last four billion years. And then Al Gore will tell you the whole thing's going to be ruined, like in the next 50 years. So four billion years? Hey, I thought we'd been through a couple of ice ages, Al. Huh? I thought we'd been through some of this before. I thought all the dinosaurs were around. They all went extinct. Do you think we'd lived through a few SUVs? And of course, we don't even believe in evolution anyway, but it's neither here nor there. But to say that the earth has been in a state of perfect balance for four billion years is, is ridiculous, to say the least. And then, of course, how could things evolve halfway between, and I've talked about this again, but evolving halfway between like an arm and a wing. Now, in order for an animal to have that wing, because if you notice animals with wings, that is their arm. Birds, you can see their, their uh, phalanges in the wing, Okay. Now, in order for an animal to evolve from a, an arm to a wing, it's going to have to decide which one it really wants. Okay? It's going to have to decide, do you want to have an arm or do you want to have a wing? Because you're not going to have both. And so your arm is going to need to become a wing. And remember, they say it started with, the, the, the flying animals were later. You know, first they're creeping and crawling animals. So, while this animal is sacrificing its arm, because remember, it's survival of the fittest, can you imagine an animal that has a full-blown arm and hand? And then an animal that has an arm that's halfway into becoming a wing. Now, it's not good enough to fly with. But then again, it's not as adept as an arm anymore either. Because now it's halfway wing. And yet it's going to survive that way for millions of years in order for it to go all the way to becoming a wing. Okay. In order for it to just get all the way... Like, who's even making it become a wing? doesn't even make sense. But, but even according to their theory, well, this happens. It's the fittest. The one with the wings survives because they can fly away. Yeah, but it took millions of years for it to get that wing. So it's just running around with this half wing. Ah! It's a sitting duck. Tyrannosaurus Chicken Rex is going to uh, eat it up like popcorn. Huh? And then, of course, every dinosaur that you'll study in books are basically half developed. Remember, God, everything that he creates, that's very good. Well, every time I go to the zoo... I'm always amazed at how very good every animal is. How balanced they are, how perfect they are, how beautiful they are. You go to the zoo, you go to the aquarium. Magnificent! I've never looked at one and said, what in the world is this piece of junk? Look at this worthless piece of junk. It's ugly. It's, how does it even survive? You never say that. They're always good. Okay, but look at the Tyrannosaurus Rex. 
And it's funny because I last time I preached about this, I talked about how the Tyrannosaurus Rex had the big strong legs, big strong body, big teeth, big eyes, and then the little arms that are like this. Like a chicken is what I even said. I am a prophet. I've, I've got, I'm going on TV. Put your hand on the screen. I can, I can tell your future. I can tell who's about to call right now. Our lines, our lines are open. 1-800-578-3495. Call right now. Call today. Are you, you are listening on the internet? Call today. The lines are open. Yes? Right? Don't tell me who you are. Tell me who you are. This is, this is uh, John Spurgett. We, we heard your article earlier. You're calling to say that you're mad that I'm personating you like a geek and I don't care. Bye. See? I was right. Oh, wait, I didn't even listen to hear if that was really him. But I know it was him because God revealed it to me. Hey, look, I must be a prophet. I must be a seer. Well, I must be a real man of God. Because when I preached on this last time, didn't I say that Tyrannosaurus Rex has these big, strong legs, big, burly body, but on every picture of a Tyrannosaurus Rex you'll ever see, it has underdeveloped arms. Because they're trying to brainwash you. No such animal ever existed with arms like this. And these little arms like twigs. God doesn't make animals like that. But they're trying to show you that he's in some kind of a period of transition where his arms are not developed right. And they're just kind of hanging out there like two chicken arms is what I said. And science has confirmed that those really are chicken arms. That, hey, we know now that when they took that syringe, they thought they were going into his leg. They were really going into his arm and they found that chicken arm. Okay? <laughs> they found that chicken arm. Now, all right, all right. How about this? I was driving down the road uh, on Interstate 8 out of San Diego and I was, I was with a co-worker that, that works for our company who's, who's not saved. And I was riding with him, and I'd given him the gospel. I'd already given him the gospel and really went into it with him. He didn't get saved. He was close, but he didn't get saved. And I, I look out the window, and I said, do you see these big piles of rocks? I mean, do you see these massive piles of rocks? And, and if, who's ever driven down that road and seen what I'm talking about? You drive eastbound out of San Diego on I-8, piles and piles of rocks. The size of mountains. Mountains that are just a pile of boulders. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's like somebody just spilled rocks everywhere. But you can see in these rocks that there's a little bit of dirt beginning to develop. Because as dust blows around, dust is going to blow through there and it's going to hit that pile of rocks and it's going to settle there. And then the rain's going to wear away a little bit of the rock and that's going to become dirt. And so what's starting to happen? You're starting to get a little bit of soil in these piles of rocks. And what's starting to happen? Plants are starting to grow a little bit out of these rocks. Just a little bit. But you know what? Not, not 100,000 years worth. You can see that this is all this process has only been going on for a few thousand years. See, a few thousand years is a number that we can comprehend. Billions of years, a, man, a human can't even co- comprehend that number. But a few thousand years, you can look at it and say, okay, I can see that this has been here, this pile has been here for a long time. Because it's getting a little bit of dirt, but it's still such a pile of rocks. And if it was there, I mean, good night. In the same amount of time that they expect me to believe that those pile of rocks have been there, the Grand Canyon was being formed by the Colorado River, according to them. So the Colorado River carved out the Grand Canyon. Yet, all the other rivers did not. Okay, they didn't carve out any Grand Canyons, number one. But number two, this pile of rocks has barely changed. I mean, it's barely changed. You say, how did the pile of rocks get there? Well, because there was called the worldwide flood. Remember, that's the other thing that, that the ungodly fool is ignorant of, willfully ignorant of, he's choosing to be ignorant of. You say, Pastor Anderson, we need to go on a crusade to teach everybody why evolution's wrong. Evolution's not the problem. People are willfully ignorant. Because they don't want to believe the Bible, because they don't want to live by the Bible. Now, you don't have to live by the Bible to be saved. But the problem is, as soon as you admit that the Bible's true, which that's what saves you, is when you believe on Jesus Christ, you believe the record that God gave of His Son, you're also kind of admitting that a lot of stuff you do is wrong. And people don't like to admit that for some reason. Now, The flood, all the sediment layers are explained by the flood, all the fossils are explained by the flood, all the piles of rocks are explained by the flood. You slosh water around. The Bible says that not only did it rain for 40 days and 40 nights, but the fountains of the deep were broken up, the Bible says. So the earth was breaking open and the groundwater was shooting out into fountains of water. And so when God caused this cataclysmic worldwide flood, it stirred up everything in such a way 
to where if you took a bottle of water, you took a, uh, take an egg, you know, a bottle, and shook it up with sand and rocks and pebbles and dirt, what's going to happen? Well, a certain weight rock is going to settle at the bottom, and then the next heaviest, and then the next heaviest, and the next heaviest. And you'll have layers of sediment exactly like you have in real life. And you're going to end up with a pile of rocks being thrown around somewhere. Because the only thing that could throw around rocks like that is the massive force of moving water that would throw it around. Oh, as the ice age, glaciers came through. How could a glacier make a pile of rocks? That doesn't even make... A glacier is solid. How does something solid moving create a pile of rocks? It pushed them into a big pile. I mean, that's so dumb. That doesn't even make sense. No, water stirred it liquid. And then things settle in a natural position. They settle into, into uh, layers of sediment. And the whole base, and maybe you don't know that much about evolution, but the whole base of evolution is the sedimentary layer. The geological column is the Bible. That's their holy Bible. The geological column is like their King James Version. Okay, that's just like, that is just the basis of everything. You nod your head because you've been to college. That's the base of everything they believe. The geological column. How do they know the Tyrannosaurus Rex was 68 million years? Easy, because that's what it was in the geological column. Because this layer is this many million, this layer, you know, crustaceous, Jurassic, whatever. Uh, those layers are everything to them. Hey, those layers were made in one year. One year's time, 365 days is how long it took those, those layers to be made. When God covered the world with a flood and it all dried out. That was, the, that was the layers. Or how about this, the fact that, I mean, I'm running out of time, good night. The, the oldest living thing in the world is 4,000 years old. Two things that are the oldest living things. One's a tree. The other is the, uh, the coral reef off the coast of Australia. is a living thing, and it's 4,000 years old. Why are there no living things beyond that? Why are there no trees? I don't think that that tree that's 4,000 years old is about to die tomorrow. I mean, if it's been around this long, I'd be willing to say it might be around for a couple more thousand. Why is there no living thing that's been around for more than, than uh, just 4,000 years? Because trees live very long. There are some trees that they say that are in the Garden of Gethsemane that, that were there when Jesus was there. Okay, because the trees, some of the trees are so old. Jesus walked by those same trees, is what they say. I don't know if that's true or not. How about, let's see some sound science from the Bible. Because see, uh, people try to say that the Bible and science don't go together. How about this? Did you know that the Bible teaches that the earth is round? And I'm going to blow through these for sake of time. The Bible teaches that the earth is round and a couple different places. Listen to this. Isaiah 40, 22. I'll just read these for you. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. It's saying God, when he, he can sit on the earth, and it's a circle, it's round, and he looks down, and the, he, people look like grasshoppers to him, because he's so big, is what it's saying. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. Uh, how about this? Job 26, 7. He stretches out the north over the empty place, did you know that the universe is empty? Did you know that it's not atmosphere, it's not air, it's not water, it's empty? How did, how did the Bible know that uh, in the oldest book of the Bible, the book of Job? He stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. No one used to know that in, the, in their false science. He hangeth the earth upon nothing. It's floating in nothingness round. It sounds to me like the Bible's got some pretty clear sound science that stood the test of time for being true. How about this? Did you know that the Bible teaches that air has weight, which is not discovered until recently? Not recently, but in the last, well, you know, the last couple hundred billion years, it was pretty recently. At least I, hey, that's recent, you know, it must have really been recent. This is like the last, uh, I believe, the last 200 years, this discovery. The Bible says, for he looketh to the ends of the earth and seeth under the whole heaven, also from the book of Job, verse, chapter 28, verse 25, to make the weight for the winds, and he weigheth the waters by measure. So he said, the winds have weight, and the water has weight. God weighs them both. So air has weight. That's a fact. Well, you wouldn't think that air has weight, would you? I mean, would you just think, oh yeah, of course, the air is really, it weighs something. You, you don't even know that it's there hardly, okay? You don't know that air weighs something. The Bible knew that. Sanitation, all throughout the Old Testament. More advanced than anything we even have today. Uh, until 200 years ago, doctors washed their hands in standing water. They would have one basin of water, and they would all walk up and wash their hands in standing water. The Bible says clearly to wash your hands in running water. 
it says in the, in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 15, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When any man hath a running issue out of his flesh, talking about a bleeding sore, a wound, because of his issue he is unclean. And this shall be his uncleanness in his issue, whether his flesh run with his issue, or his flesh be stopped from his issue, it is uncleanness. Every bed whereon he lieth that hath the issue is unclean. And everything whereon he sitteth shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself with water and be unclean until the evening. And he that sitteth on anything whereon he sat that had the issue shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And he that toucheth the flesh of him that hath the issue shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Remember that really boring book that you don't like to read Leviticus? Boy, this could save you a lot of illness, save you a lot of sickness, a lot of trouble. Could have saved the lives of 40 million people in Europe in the Black Plague in the Middle Ages. And if, and if he that hath an issue spit upon him that is clean. Don't you hate it when that happens. You go in some hospital somewhere, some dirty sick person spits on you. And you're like, good night. Not again. And you know, you think, I parked out in the clergy parking spot. You know, I walk in with a Bible in my hand and some guy spit on me. Now I'm unclean. I've got to wash my flesh in running water. Good night. It's not even bath night yet. That comes on Saturdays. And whosoever toucheth anything that was under him shall be unclean until the even. And he that beareth any of those things, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> on and on, uh, I won't belabor it. But the Bible says, and when he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue, then he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing. We'll still wait a little while, saying, make sure your all germs are gone. And wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in running water and shall be clean. Isn't that, that's pretty advanced. We take these things for granted. That's very advanced. Okay, that's very advanced science. How about the fact that light is constantly in motion? Only if you're reading a King James Bible. Job 38, 19. Where is the way where light dwelleth. And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? That's Job 38.19. God's very careful to say that darkness dwells in a place, but there's a way where light dwelleth. There's no place where light dwelleth, because light is always in motion, 187,000 miles per second. Okay, and so the Bible knows what it's talking about. How about the fact that hell is in the center of the earth? And now here we are, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, we've discovered that the whole earth is filled with fire, except for the crust only, which is one to ten miles thick. And then the whole rest of the earth is the mantle, and then the outer core, and then the inner core, as if they know what's going on 5,000 miles below our feet right now. I know what's going on 5,000 miles below our feet. People are burning in hell. I read about it in the Bible. But, but, does, but does Dr. Spurgle agree with you? I don't care what Dr. Spurgle thinks. Hey, that's what the Bible says. Now, how about this? And this is where I'm going to close. I had a whole another page of the sermon. All Xerox is off and handed out after service. <laughs> but I have a whole other page of the sermon. I'm going to close with this. Look at Job 40. Job chapter number 40. <clears throat> Job chapter number 40. I'd like you to turn there. We're going to read about <coughs> dinosaurs in the Bible. Now, when were dinosaurs discovered by foolish, lustful, ignorant, sinful scientists who believe in evolution. Well, they were discovered in the 19th century. They were discovered in the 1800s. They found these fossils, which were created by the flood. That's why they're found of sea creatures and fish in mountains. Because the whole tops of the mountains were covered, the Bible says. But uh, how in the world did God... Speak to Job back in these days, and, and, and remember, the Bible is written by a man, right? How in the world did the man who wrote the book of Job, how did he know about dinosaurs way back 3,600 years ago? How did he know about, how did he know about these uh, dinosaurs? Because he was, was he uh, going to Montana and uh, studying these? I mean, was he there with his little brush and... You know, and his little khaki little shorts on, and his little his little hat on, and his little geolite, his little pick, and his little hammer, and his little magnifying glass. Is that how Job knew about this? 
How do you know about dinosaurs? How long, you know, 3,400 years before they were discovered by man. Because remember, according to the evolutionists, dinosaurs existed millions of years before man. They did not coexist. Evolution clearly teaches that dinosaurs and man two totally different epochs of, of history. Well, let's listen as... And, and before I read this, I don't want you to think that I believe in all dinosaurs, because I don't. I think most dinosaurs are figment of people's imagination. They're lies, they're deceit. Uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, for example, with the, with the chicken arms. Uh, it's a lie. It's false. So don't, I don't want you to think that I believe in all these dinosaurs that are out there, because I don't. But there are some dinosaurs that have really existed. You know, I, I've read accounts of, of a Japanese uh, fishing boat that came across a giant, this is a, a, around 1910, a giant sea monster. I mean, a giant monster that was just huge. And it was much like what we're going to read about in a moment. And it was still living in, you know, I mean, we're talking about less than 100 years ago. And it died on the seashore. And they, they uh, took all, you know, they couldn't document stuff as well back then. They couldn't, you know, it wasn't as advanced. But they, I mean, they took pictures of it. I mean, they, they wrote all about it. They measured it. They studied it. It was a giant sea serpent. Giant sea monster. You know, have you ever heard of the Loch Ness Monster? It's been sighted 5,000 times. It's probably real. Hey, I think I, there probably really is a big sea creature in Loch Ness. It's been sighted 5,000 times. Maybe they're all lying. I don't know. I'm not going to go there. Okay. See me after the service. We'll speculate together. And, uh, but look at Job chapter 40, verse number 15. We will read about biblical accounts of some true dinosaurs that did exist. Two. One of them is a land dinosaur called Behemoth. The other is a sea serpent, uh, a sea monster known as Leviathan. Let's read about these animals. And how in the world did Job know about these? I have no clue. I think it must have been that God spoke the word. Is what really happened. It must be divinely inspired by God. <clears throat> the Bible reads, Behold now Behemoth, which I made with thee. See, he said, I made it the same day as you. The sixth day I made man and I made Behemoth. Isn't that clear in the Bible? In the Bible consistent? which I made with thee. He eateth grass as an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moved his tail like a cedar. That's a big tail. Okay, this is probably what scientists have created, like a brontosaurus type animal. Okay. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are are strong as pieces of brass. I'm sorry, I'm reading wrong. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food, where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reeds and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. See, it's saying he, he, drink, he can drink up a river of water so large. Now, it doesn't say that he can really drink the river of Jordan. It's just saying in his mind. I mean, he thinks that's how much water he needs because it's so big. Okay. The Bible is very clear when it, when it speaks. It doesn't say things that are contradictory. He taketh it with his eyes. His nose pierceth through snares. Now, that's the extent of the description of Behemoth. A great land animal who rests under trees, who climbs mountains, who has a tail that swings like a cedar, who can drink giant quantities of water, a uh, fearful beast, that God is the one who said, I can destroy the Hemoth. But look at, this, look at this more in-depth description of another dinosaur, Leviathan. Verse 1 of chapter 41. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook? He said, are you going to go fishing and get this on the end of your line and pull it in? He says, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose, or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird? Or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? He says, Are you going to take one home to your daughter? Okay. He says, uh, Shall the companions make a banquet of him? So they part him among the merchants. They say, is anybody going to hunt this thing and, and eat it? Basically, he's saying, there's no way. It's a rhetorical question. He's saying, none of these things could ever happen. 
Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? Talking about people that would maybe try to hunt this animal and, and retrieve. They can't. It's too large. It's too mighty. Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. He begins to describe in here verse 12. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his prize. He's a sea creature that has scales like a fish. He has a, he has a mouth with teeth. And the Bible calls it the doors of his face. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. By his kneesings, a light doth shine. Now, kneesings is talking about like sneezings. It's talking about sneezing but not sneezing because it's talking about breathing out your nose. That's what kneesings are. Uh, he breathes out his nose and the Bible says a light doth shine. Like a spark, like fire. Coming out of his nose. A fire breathing dragon? Yes, a fire breathing dragon really existed. Now, did it, you know, burn up a whole city or something? No. But it says that when he goes, that fire comes out, smoke comes out of his nose, and, and a light shines. Now, there are animals, you say, that's bizarre, that's ridiculous. There are animals alive right now that can do that. You need to study science, you need to study biology, and understand that there are animals that can produce an explosion. There are animals that combust themselves, that blow up. There are bugs that can mix two chemicals that explode and blow things up. There are animals that live way down in the depths of the sea that glow like they're lit up like a neon light. Okay? There are animals that can produce heat and fire today on the earth. Okay? Now, not in these kind of proportions. On a very small scale. But this animal actually breathed out what was like a... a Somewhat like fire. I mean, it, it, it lit up. It lit up, to say the least. At least there was a, a spark of a flame when he breathed out of his nose. By his leavings, a light doth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out of his mouth. You see that? See, I don't believe that. Well, start believing the Bible tonight. Decide right now, April 15th, you're going to believe the Bible when you read it. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. Could the Bible say it any more clearly? It's a fire-breathing dragon. Reality, my friend. Where did they get the idea for the fire-breathing dragon? Because somebody saw one, and they drew a picture of it. That's why. The Bible says, In his neck remaineth strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone. Yea, as, a, as a hard as a piece of the nether millstone. Of course, uh, the heart is a muscle. So his muscle is so tensed that it's like stone in its consistency. Uh, the Bible says in verse number 25, When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breaking, they purify themselves. And they, people get right with God when they get around them. They're praying to God that they can survive. And so they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold. The spear, the dart, nor the habergen. He's saying if you shot a spear at it, if you tried to stab with a sword, uh, his scales are so tightly woven together, as was described earlier, you can't even pierce through his skin with a sword or with a hook. You can't even uh, barbed wire, I talked about earlier. The Bible reads in verse number 27, He esteemeth iron as straw, and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh the path to shine after him. One would think the depth to be hoary. Upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. 
That's what, that's what the scientists should be saying. That's what Mr. Spurgel should be saying. I uttered things that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself, and repent in dust and ashes. See, that's the Bible. The Bible knows more than any scientist knows. Any, don't ever let some scientist talk down to you. Don't let the Dr. Spurgles of this world talk down their nose at you and tell, oh, you're one of those ignorant Christians. Oh, you believe in creation? You really believe the earth is 6,000 years old? <laughs> Come on! Are you nuts? This would take billions of years to come from nothing. It would take billions of years for things to just spring into life of their own accord. It would take billions of years for big rocks, piles of rocks to appear out of nowhere. No, it would take the breath of God's mouth and no amount of time could, could be a substitute for that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, please just help us. We, we all know that God created the earth in six days. I'm not trying to convince anybody of that. There's no point in trying to convince anybody of that because the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And if you try to answer a fool according to his folly, uh, you're going to be found to be like him. You're going to sound like a fool discussing soup with Dr. Spurgle. And so we, we're not trying to, to disprove evolution to the person who's willfully ignorant. Because any time they want to, they can decide to quit being ignorant and acknowledge Jesus Christ as the creator of the world. But Father, we study these things to know the certainty of what we believe. And just to stand in awe for a few moments of your marvelous creation. And in awe of the magnificent, perfect word of God. The ultimate science book. The science textbook. The history textbook. The mathematics textbook. The source of all human knowledge. The source of all knowledge, period. God, please help us to pick it up and read it. So that we can become wise. And not be the fools of this world with their higher learning. At the Princetons and Stanfords and Harvards of this world. God, help the man who spends $45,000 per year, which is the tuition, to go to Harvard. God, I wish that that man today would just go to the 98 cent store. And pull out a crumpled up dollar bill and lay it on the counter and say, would you give me all knowledge in the entire universe? Would you hand me a King James Bible off the shelf?